everybody and calm down. Oh, today you don't want to miss this broadcast. Joining us live will be Mike from around the world. That's right. Mike from around the world will be joining us. We've got, we've got to talk about North Korea. We've got to get some in, in, information. How serious is this? What is Russia doing? What is China doing? Where are all the battleships? Where are all the troops going? How come the Russia's building up thousands of troops along the North Korean border? How come China's doing it? How come Russia's still building 100,000 troops along the borders with the NATO countries like Poland and Estonia and um, Latvia and um, Lithuania? I mean, why? And also, what is the United States doing to protect Guam? Does our THAAD missile system, is it in place to protect not only South Korea, but Japan, Guam, Hawaii? Is Kim Jong-un this dangerous? So we got to get Mike from around the world. Also, the water's turning blood red. We're going to show you actual footage of the river running blood red in Indonesia. A sign, a biblical sign. No question, no question, a sign from the Bible of the end times. And we're going to discuss Yellowstone, that super volcano. Mike around the world, what's, is, is Planet X causing all of this? Is Planet X, is Nibiru? Mike, the five waves of energy, is that what's making all this lava become so volatile and rising to the surface? Is Yellowstone super volcano, is this thing gonna blow? We're going to ask Mike from around the world all these questions plus a whole lot more. This will be a this will be a broadcast for the ages. Very important that you get your hands on this information and share it with your family and friends. Don't miss today's live broadcast starts at 12 noon Eastern. That's 12 noon Eastern on all of my channels. New live stream, Roku satellite, paulbegleyprophecy.com, Blog Talk Radio. Live, uh, you, YouTube Live, Periscope, everywhere, live, 12 noon Eastern. And if you say, oh, Paul, I'm on the road, I can't, I, I can't watch it, I'm driving, or, then use your cell phone or iPhone, and you can get a Paul Begley Prophecy app for free and download it on your phones. It's at the Google Plus Store, or it's at the Apple Store. And if none of those things work for you, just dial this number, 347-324. 5208. That's 347 324 5208. Listen to the broadcast live on your phone. Don't miss it. Get it. And, and if, if, if this doesn't work, get some coffee and calm down. If that don't work, get the tea.com. That's right. Just go to get the tea.com and tell Ronnie you need some tea to deal with this. What? Are you serious? If that don't work, pray. Oh, 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 wait, pray first. <laughs> I mean, seriously, in all seriousness, it is a very serious situation. Very. We've never been here before. All right. Give your life to Jesus Christ. I'll see you guys at 12 noon Eastern. The Lord's coming soon.
On June 27, 2014, a large lava flow broke out on the northeast side of Puuo'o and began to head east. It cut through miles of forest during the summer, and by October it was approaching Pahoa. A Pa'a road and the Pahoa transfer station were closed and emergency preparations began. With the lava burning through fields only a few hundred yards away, Helco workers hurried to protect power poles in its path. The poles were surrounded with insulation, cement blocks, and a big pile of cinder to keep the lava from burning the wooden poles. Lava ran directly into one of the power poles as it crossed the Pa'a Road in the early morning hours of October 25th. The power pole was completely surrounded, but survived the intense heat of the flow. The protection worked. Below the road, the lava flow continued down through pasture, burning or burying fences and crumpling a metal shed along the way. The flows entered the top of the Sugimoto's property on October 28th and burned through their macadamia nut orchard. Listen for the methane blasts. These happen when gas from burning roots ignites and explodes. The lava burned things like this pile of old tires, but old trucks and pieces of metal got covered or embedded in the lava. Fire and civil defense workers were there to make sure everyone was safe. The lava flows start out only a few feet high, but over three days this lava inflated until it overflowed five foot high dirt walls. This sped up video shows how lava flows inflate like a balloon. The outside crust moves up as lava continues to fill the inside of the flow. Some flows can get pushed up to higher than the top of a school bus. The lower flows stop before they reach the village road or any homes in Pahoa. But on November 10th, a new flow broke out near Apa'a Road and moved toward an empty house. One branch of the flow moved along the road and into the driveway, and another flowed right up to the edge of the garage building, but stopped just a few feet away. Sadly, lava reached the house. All that is left is the metal roof on top of the lava, though the garage is still standing. New breakouts of lava continued above Apa'a and soon reached the transfer station. They first flowed around the dirt wall outside the fence and began to inflate. Then lava broke out, burned its way through the fence and flowed down the walls. Lava headed straight toward them. Less than a mile away now, a slow-motion disaster they're watching out for. ABC's Clayton Sandell reporting in tonight. Tonight, a powerful volcano that helped create the Big Island of Hawaii is now threatening thousands of people who live here. A river of red-hot lava quickly oozing the length of six football fields in just the last two days. You can see just below here in these cracks is actual molten lava. The flow erupted from the Kilauea volcano in June, traveling downhill 11 miles, now less than one mile from the small town of Pahoa. It's really the geography that controls where this lava goes, sometimes speeding up, sometimes it's slowing down, but it's always a threat. 
For some of the 10,000 people affected, evacuations could be just days away. Road construction crews are racing to make sure they have a way out. The island is no stranger to Kilauea's power. It's been steadily erupting since 1983, wiping out nearly 200 homes in 1990. The volcano has been belching explosions of fiery lava ever since, and now shows no sign of cooling off. On the leading edge of a lava flow on the big island of Hawaii, this came from the Kilauea volcano. This particular lava flow started on June 27th, and it has traveled about 11 miles so far. And the problem is it's headed right for a small town of Pahoa. Take a look at what we're standing on here. This is lava that uh, flowed probably just 24 hours ago. And if you look carefully, you can see just below here in these cracks is actual molten lava. Thousands of degrees down there. So we're going to try and stay out of the dangerous stuff. Take a look at this. Every once in a while on the lava field, you'll see these hollowed out uh, half tubes here with white powder in them. What that is, is a tree that fell down and then was surrounded by lava. The lava kind of formed a tube around the tree and turned away. So that white stuff you're seeing is actually ash from a tree that no longer exists. We just kind of wanted to give you a sense of what it's like here. It is incredibly hot. It's almost like literally standing inside of a furnace. And we start with this bird's eye view of the Pu'u'o'o crater, the source of the 13 mile long lava flow that could reach Pahoa Town in the next few days. And with the danger more clear and present, tonight a huge crowd gathered in the Pahoa High Cafeteria to find out exactly when their homes would be cut off. After weeks of waiting, those families may not have much time left. The lava's been picking up speed as it moves downhill through a gully. Well, since the weekend, the flow has been advancing three or 400 yards a day. Our Mileka Lincoln is live in Pahoa with a new estimate for arrival. Mileka? Aloha, Stephanie Keahi. Yes, in fact, there was an audible gasp from the crowd that had gathered tonight at the Pahoa High School cafeteria for the weekly Lava Flow community update meeting. When USGS geologists with the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory say if the lava flow continues at its current rate of speed, it could reach a Pa'a Street by tomorrow. And that's exactly why barricades are up and law enforcement is out here at Cemetery Road, which actually curves and turns into a Pa'a Street, which is completely shut down from here at Ka'ohe Homesteads Road out towards the Pahoa Transfer Station. Now, the Puna lava flow has pushed more than 500 yards that's the length of five football fields in just the last 24 hours. USGS scientists say the advanced rate picked up considerably because of that terrain you mentioned that the lava is moving through, essentially a narrow gulf that's being fed by a steady supply of lava. Eruption, like the one under Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. The European Science Foundation has released a 70-page report called Extreme Geohazards, reducing the disaster risk and increasing resilience. It references the Yellowstone supervolcano. Now, Yellowstone's volcano doesn't look like some others because it's a caldera or a crater. It, it, it's around, the, uh, uh, around ground level instead of towering into the clouds. But scientists say it covers a really enormous reserve of magma beneath the Earth's surface. We have a rendering of what scientists say this underneath that volcano, an ocean of molten rock, they tell us, that stretches for hundreds of miles. Of course, nobody needs to freak out right now at all. Scientists say there's a, only about a 10% chance of an eruption like this happening any time this century. So there's a, there's a good chance you'll never see it. But 10%, I mean, that's not tiny. And the U.S. Geological Survey noted last year, even if Yellowstone does erupt, it could be a small incident, not some Armageddon type thing. Michio Kaku joins us now. He's a theoretical physicist, a professor, a best-selling author, and friend, friend, of the pro, friend of the program. Give us some context on this, what we're talking about here. Well, forget the image of Yogi Bear representing Yellowstone. We're talking about a sleeping Godzilla underneath Yellowstone that if it erupts in a maximum eruption called Category 8, 
it could literally tear the guts out of the United States of America. Instead of having 50 states of the Union, we would only have 30 states of the Union. Now that's Category 8. This report looked at Category 7, which is much more likely once every thousand years rather than once every million years. That means in every century, there's a 10% chance that somewhere on the planet Earth there could be a supervolcanic Category 7 eruption. That's the danger. You, you just talked about a volcano that could, could wipe out 20 states. How, how in the world is that possible? Well, it's happened before. 2.1 million years ago, 1.3, and also 0.6 million years ago. We have the evidence of a gigantic eruption that is sufficient to tear the guts out of the U.S. of A. So this report has to be taken seriously, but hey, don't sell the store, don't panic. We don't expect it to happen in our lifetime. It, it, it's, it's hard really to imagine this, this lake of lava that stretches hundreds of miles in all directions. It, uh, how do we know that and how, how, how do they read that? Well, just two years ago, there was a scare, in fact. We actually began to measure the size of this lava hotspot, and it turned out to be twice as big as we previously thought. However, uh, the good news is that it's not migrating, it's not moving, we see no indication whatsoever that a big one is coming. However, eventually the law of averages catches up to you. And this report singled out uh, Mount Vesuvius outside Naples, Italy, outside Mexico City and Yellowstone as three hotspots where a Category 7 volcanic eruption could indeed take place in this century. So there are only three of this size in all the world? Well, there are several in um, Indonesia and uh, New Zealand that have had Category 8 eruptions, in fact. But then again, we're talking about once every million years for Category 8. Category 7 will be many times the size of Mount St. Helen, enough to cause widespread destruction across the state, but not enough to destroy the U.S. of A. But still, something that we have to take very seriously now. What would we get in the way of warnings, Michio? Well, unlike a media from outer space, where you get no warning whatsoever, we get warnings. If you've seen movies like Pompeii, you know that there are days, in fact weeks, of eruptions building up, grumbling inside, underneath the ground, near the, the pocket of lava. So there would be enough time, several weeks, in order to begin evacuation, if and when such an unlikely event were to take place. All right, Michio Kaku on the news deck. No time to panic, but interesting, very interesting. Thank you. Ground deformation is near the Norris Geyser Basin, the hottest and most unstable thermal basin in the park. Norris Geyser Basin is one of the most dynamic of the hydrothermal areas at Yellowstone. Um, it's always changing. We're always noticing new things that are happening. Just a few years ago, satellite images showed Yellowstone's greatest rise in this area. Recently, however, it's reversed its direction and is now subsiding. It's not actually within the Yellowstone caldera, yet it's one of the, the highest temperature thermal areas in the park. And it is possible that there is some magma extending uh, to the north beneath that region. The source of the basin's volatility could be magma, or another key component to volcanic activity, earthquakes. The earthquakes are essentially the heartbeat of the system. They are an integral part of the active, uh, if you wish, uh, mountain building and volcanism of Yellowstone. Like smoke and fire, volcanoes and earthquakes go hand in hand. The pressure from the magma, which can explode into a volcano, also forces the ground to shift, causing earthquakes. They can be the telltale signs of an impending eruption. The two main precursors to a volcanic eruption, seismicity and ground deformation, are very carefully monitored in Yellowstone. In this computer model, each red dot represents an earthquake. Typically, hundreds of earthquakes are detected across the park each year. In recent years, the greatest earthquake activity has been centered under two areas of the park. Well, you can see we have earthquakes that are concentrated on the north side of Yellowstone coming down through the park and then out extending on the east side of the Teton Fault right here. What concerns geologists is when a center of earthquake activity overlaps an area of shifting terrain. At the Norris Geyser Basin, that seems to be what's happening. 
there are dozens of fault lines at this spot. That's very critical because if magma is starting to move up, we would expect to see a bulging in an area and associated earthquakes as the ground starts to crack. The fear is faults that make up the earthquake zone could crack under pressure from the magma below, releasing an eruption. Geologists are also watching the park's geysers, hot springs, and mud pots, looking for drastic changes in temperatures and chemical content. Anything that might indicate a major movement of magma. At the moment, geologists do not believe an eruption is imminent. But if the water temperatures were to rise, the ground begin to swell, or there were an increase in earthquake activity, another Yellowstone eruption could be building. I think that we are smart enough as uh, geoscientists now that we would probably have weeks to perhaps months of uh, indicators before anything like that would occur. However, predicting the precise timing of an eruption is far from simple. Scientists have been fooled in the past. We've seen it in Yellowstone. There's bulging, there's vibrations, there's increased seismicity. There's all the things one would expect and go, oh, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And then, nothing. Supervolcanoes like Yellowstone could explode suddenly, without warning, without seismic movement signaled as earthquakes. When we think of an explosive volcanic eruption, we imagine it being preceded by earthquakes, by ground swelling, by the mountain venting some hot gas, perhaps even some lava. These are the signs we look for in the inexact science of volcanic predictions. But two research papers published on the very same day this year say that predicting supervolcano eruptions is even more difficult than predicting the eruptions of regular volcanoes. More on that in a moment. But first, do the events in Yellowstone earlier this year demonstrate changes that may be building toward an eruption? We did have an earthquake of 4.8 magnitude. Now that is the largest we've had in Yellowstone in over 30 years. And a couple of months later, shuts down a road that's melted because of increased ground temperature people start to get edgy about an impending eruption. I went to Yellowstone recently, and geothermal activity is everywhere. A reminder that you're on top of a super caldera and magma dome, the largest on Earth. Frankly, we are just a, a few miles above some really hot magma. That magma serves as the heat that fuels the geysers and hot springs and fumaroles in the park. It's that engine that allows for the unique things that we see here in Yellowstone. This is what the melted road looks like two months later. Yellowstone spokesman at the time said the road had turned to soup, and that was widely reported, even in the mainstream media. But when I spoke to a ranger there, she dismissed it as simply a bad asphalt job. That was closed due to uh, melting the heat. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. That was just a couple of days. It was the asphalt was soft. Mm -hmm. It was actually a, a bad asphalt job that they had done the summer previous to that. Okay. And that combined with the intensity of the sun in the middle of the summer, um, and that it was in a hydrothermal area, that it just got soft. Oh, okay. And they right. just had to replace it. So it had nothing to do with an increase in geothermal activity in that area, no. the ground being hotter. It was just no. the asphalt, was it? The, the asphalt, yeah, it was the combination of those things in that particular spot. I hadn't visited Firehole Lake Drive when I spoke to her, or I would have challenged what she told me. Two months later, the road still doesn't look good. But more importantly, Yellowstone spokesman told the press at the time that people needed to stay away from the road because there was a high danger of stepping on seemingly solid soil into severely hot water. Contrary to what she said, Firehole Lake is an active geothermal area, and you can see that the road deteriorates as it comes into proximity to geothermal features. But it's what we've come to expect from government employees at every level, fear for their job if controversy erupts, and contempt for the public's right to know. If it was just a bad asphalt job, heated up by the sun, rather than increased ground temperature, then why are there other melted paved areas that they've just fenced off rather than try to fix? My suspicion is that the spots are so hot at the moment that they can't fix them. Ground temperature goes up and down with seismic activity in the park. We see between 1,000 and 3,000 earthquakes a year in Yellowstone. Most of them are so small, nobody ever feels them. Swarms of small earthquakes that you can't even feel can cause the ground to go through major changes. Look at this area that was once a forest. 
The ground was a hospitable environment for trees to grow for a long period of time. Then in 1978, swarms of small earthquakes caused the ground in this area to rise to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't the quakes, but the heat that killed the trees. So while we may be heading into another period of increased activity in Yellowstone, it's far from the largest activity we've seen since it became a park. Of course, everyone will tell you that it's not if, but when the Super Caldera blows up. Yellowstone's supervolcano has been hit by a series of earthquakes, with more 30 recorded since June 12. The latest was recorded on Monday, June 19, with a magnitude 3 earthquake striking 8.6 miles north-northeast of West Yellowstone, Montana. The swarm began last week, and on June 15 saw a magnitude 4.5 earthquake take place in Yellowstone National Park. The epicenter of the shock was located in Yellowstone National Park, eight miles north-northeast of the town of West Yellowstone, Montana. Scientists from the University of Utah, which monitors Yellowstone Volcano, said in a statement. The earthquake was reportedly felt in the towns of West Yellowstone and Gardner, Montana, in Yellowstone National Park, and elsewhere in the surrounding region. This earthquake was the largest to have hit Yellowstone since March 30, 2014, when a magnitude 4.8 earthquake was recorded 18 miles to the east, near the Norris Giza Basin. The 4.5 earthquake is part of an energetic sequence of earthquakes in the same area that began on June 12, the statement continued. This sequence has included approximately 30 earthquakes of magnitude 2 and larger and 4 earthquakes of magnitude 3 and larger, including today's magnitude 4.5 event. As of June 16, 235 events had been recorded. Most of these ranged in the magnitude of 0 to 1, with 5 less than 0. The University of Utah is part of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, YVO, which monitors volcanic and earthquake activity in Yellowstone National Park. Seismic activity at volcanoes can signal an eruption is due to take place, although predicting exactly when a volcano will erupt is as you see the calderas left by the magma plume at Yellowstone. Um, so you can see that uh, the Earth's crust has moved across this plume and subsequent eruptions um, you can see are moving further north as the crust moves in a different direction. The magma plume itself is not what anybody thought. Uh, usually they don't tell us a whole lot about the magma plume, but it's not a ball of magma. And the magma plume is actually not traversing up vertically from depths. It is coming up at a lateral motion from Idaho, where it's deep into Yellowstone, where it is getting very shallow. This is a diagram showing you where most of the earthquakes are occurring is in this blue zone, where uh, the magma percolates. Um, and uh, it starts to separate out and, and become uh, superficial, closer to the surface, different compositions. But when magma filters through cracks and then percolates back down, it hardens and forms these dikes. These dikes compartmentalize the underneath ground into chambers. The dikes have a tendency to crack and break and fill empty chambers, uh, thereby creating an overflow system for the park itself. And it's not unusual to have a uh, new substance come up and form different dikes uh, for different substances of different temperatures and different liquidity. Uh, the rhyolite, uh, like I say, this is this is a rhyolite slab. It, that is really the big question mark as to how it will behave uh, under this type of structure. Um, these are cracks. They go deep into the ground. Um, they look like honeycomb from the air. Uh, magma fills and seeps in, and then the compartmentalized uh, magma will create a much smaller crater inside the caldera itself. And th this is an example of what we're hoping if, if there's an eruption will happen. It'll be a small eruption from one of these chambers. Long Valley is a different story altogether. The central magma chamber is creating all the uplift in this area. Um, it's a central resurgent dome. Um, we don't want that to go. 
but this explains why Yellowstone is so well behaved. Uh, notice though, the cylinder is a diagram showing what happens in the convection zone, where there's a lot of churning, uh, liquid magma, uh, foaming magma, and water. Uh, you get a, a positive and a negative polarity between the colder and the hotter um, um, barriers and boundaries, and that's what gives rise to some of the electromagnetic events that you see surrounding volcanoes and even some seismic earthquakes that do occur in volcanic zones, because we know that uh, seismic zones and vol volcanism go hand in hand. But this is a really nice structure, really, for, um, notice the rhyolitic magma on the top, and, um, and notice the at the edges of the caldera is where we have our intrusions. This intrusion spreads out laterally and flattens out. It's not very deep uh, the, at the four two kilometer depth. depth. There, it's rather shallow. Um, that's the rhyolite keeping it down. Don't let uh, ash fields discourage you here. Even in the 600,000 year ago eruption, the tectonic plates and the shifting of the crust has placed things in a completely different arrangement than they were back then. Even the jet stream has changed. So we're predicting a left to right or east to west. OK, there's a lot of seismometers placed all around the caldera. And uh, they're just measuring devices. The geology of this area is pretty uh, complex. But the thing to notice is there are some fault zones that go near the surface. This is the part that they're targeting. The thing is, with this huge amount of high-pressure magma, if there is ever a breakthrough to the surface, you're going to have a major eruption. And it, it is just a tiny, tiny crack in the rock, uh, what they call a tornillo, where you have a magma intrusion and then a flow. And once that reaches the surface, basically it's unstoppable so what kind of thing are they are they doing here here's the the uh, fault fault zone that's been under attack for two years this is uh, uh, dang it I forget the name of that they, they made all three of these they're attacking three sites and they've got like Maple Lake uh, mirror I forget darn it Anyway, this is the equipment, or it's something similar to the equipment they're using. They have a computer-controlled array of this type of uh, device. It's called a vibro-sized truck. This is a 60-ton truck that can press this steel plate down and produce, actually, uh, earthquakes. And when they're arranged in an array, you have the ability to put these pressure waves into the earth, which I'll show in a minute. And yes, they're absolutely huge. Huge. They're used for natural gas exploration because you can actually map the underlying rock with these uh, seismic waves. Here's a vibro-size uh, waveform. Just a typical thump on the ground and the kind of thing that uh, happens. And it looks like it's peaking about 10,000 pound force here. And uh, here's one that's actually frequency swept. You want to remember this is the kind of kind of a waveform they can It's happening every 100,000 or so. And satellites show us giant craters all over the world that have just been filled in with water or filled in with uh, trees, filled in with foliage. I don't know all the mysteries of the universe, but I know this. The ring of fire from the Pacific Ocean all the way around from Asia to the tip of Chile has triggered everywhere in the last decade but key plates off California. Now the sun's cooled off. That affects our climate. Is that doing it? Is it the magnetic field? He's the expert because he, he looks at all the studies, the full spectrum. So many experts at the university level just write their own little papers in their one little area and don't do the general research. 
He's with us for the rest of the hour, five minutes of the next hour, standeo.com. And the last time he was on was over a year ago. Time flies, February 6, 2015. You can pull that interview up. You can hear it for yourself. But the body of his work's there, the books he's written. He has predicted things more accurately than anybody I have read or talked to. Here's the headline, volcanic expert, super eruption coming. And now you see what they're calling unprecedented eruptions, unprecedented geological activity, tectonic activity. And going over uh, his bio, he held an above top secret security clearance and worked undercover with the FBI. He was part of an exclusive black project specializing in the development of advanced technology. Stan's diverse background in Encompasses computer programming, marine architecture, advanced propulsion engineering, biblical studies, and earthquake forecasting. And I'm not going to go over all the things that he's breaking down, but we're going to get into earthquakes with him right now. Uh, pretty wild stuff. Stan Dale, great uh, to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me again, Alex. Uh, there's certainly a lot happening to talk about. Well, everything you said over a year ago here, I thought it was six months ago, has, is, is basically now happening. Tell us what's happening from your research. What's coming next? Because obviously the government and people are going to play this now. Well, there are probably good reasons for that. Uh, not that I side with the the Illuminists; <laughs> they they have their own agenda. But the the scientific community is is uh, hamstrung, and if they weren't, they have the fear of causing a panic if they predict an earthquake or a volcano, and it doesn't happen. And so they're put in a between a rock and a hard place to tell the public. And now that, of course, they've got a, a White House muzzle on them, so they can't say anything. I have gotten information out uh, that is not mainstream or is not even on the Internet from um, a couple of individuals who are uh, involved inside USGS. And they have said that they've been making drivers, truck drivers and uh, technicians that are delivering stuff to USGS at Yellowstone have been for the last two years to not tell anybody about it uh, and the number of seismometers that they're putting in and the fact that they're connected to a supercomputer. I think they've moved it from Texas now then to uh, Utah to the new center, but there, there's a lot of effort being pointed at Yellowstone and uh, uh, you can see the evidence of it uh, in a lot of the video coming out of there that they're allowing to come out. And also last uh, month, toward the end of the month, they closed down the whole network of size monitors, um, you know. The other area of striking ground deformation is near the Norris Geyser Basin, the hottest and most unstable thermal basin in the park. Norris Geyser Basin is one of the most dynamic of the hydrothermal areas at Yellowstone. Um, it's always changing. We're always noticing new things that are happening. Just a few years ago, satellite images showed Yellowstone's greatest rise in this area. Recently, however, it's reversed its direction and is now subsiding. It's not actually within the Yellowstone caldera, yet it's one of the, the highest temperature thermal areas in the park. And it is possible that there is some magma extending uh, to the north beneath that region. The source of the basin's volatility could be magma, or another key component to volcanic activity, earthquakes. The earthquakes are essentially the heartbeat of the system. They are an integral part of the active, uh, if you wish, uh, mountain building and volcanism of Yellowstone. Like smoke and fire, volcanoes and earthquakes go hand in hand. The pressure from the magma which can explode into a volcano also forces the ground to shift, causing earthquakes. They can be the telltale signs of an impending eruption. The two main precursors to a volcanic eruption, seismicity and ground deformation, are very carefully monitored in Yellowstone. In this computer model, each red dot represents an earthquake. Typically, hundreds of earthquakes are detected across the park each year. In recent years, the greatest earthquake activity has been centered under two areas of the park. So you can see we have earthquakes that are concentrated on the north side of Yellowstone coming down through the park and then out extending on the east side of the Teton Fault right here. What concerns geologists is when a center of earthquake activity overlaps an area of shifting terrain. At the Norris Geyser Basin, that seems to be what's happening. There are dozens of fault lines at this spot. That's very critical because if magma is starting to move up, we would expect to see a bulging in an area and associated earthquakes as the ground starts to crack. 
The fear is faults that make up the earthquake zone could crack under pressure from the magma below, releasing an eruption. Geologists are also watching the park's geysers, hot springs, and mud pots, looking for drastic changes in temperatures and chemical content. Anything that might indicate a major movement of magma. At the moment, geologists do not believe an eruption is imminent. But if the water temperatures were to rise, the ground begin to swell, or there were an increase in earthquake activity, another Yellowstone eruption could be building. I think that we are smart enough as uh, geoscientists now that we would probably have weeks to perhaps months of uh, indicators before anything like that would occur. However, predicting the precise timing of an eruption is far from simple. Scientists have been fooled in the past. We've seen it in Yellowstone. There's bulging, there's vibrations, there's increased seismicity. There's all the things one would expect and go, oh, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And then, nothing. Supervolcanoes like Yellowstone could explode suddenly, without warning, without seismic movement signaled as earthquakes. When we think of an explosive volcanic eruption, we imagine it being preceded by earthquakes, by ground swelling, by the mountain venting some hot gas, perhaps even some lava. These are the signs we look for in the inexact science of volcanic predictions. But two research papers published on the very same day this year say that predicting supervolcano eruptions is even more difficult than predicting the eruptions of regular volcanoes. More on that in a moment. But first, do the events in Yellowstone earlier this year demonstrate changes that may be building toward an eruption? We did have an earthquake of 4.8 magnitude. Now that is the largest we've had in Yellowstone in over 30 years. And a couple of months later shuts down a road that's melted because of increased ground temperature people start to get edgy about an impending eruption. I went to Yellowstone recently, and geothermal activity is everywhere. A reminder that you're on top of a super caldera and magma dome, the largest on Earth. Frankly, we are just a, a few miles above some really hot magma. That magma serves as the heat that fuels the geysers and hot springs and fumaroles in the park. It's that engine that allows for the unique things that we see here in Yellowstone. This is what the melted road looks like two months later. Yellowstone spokesman at the time said the road had turned to soup, and that was widely reported, even in the mainstream media. But when I spoke to a ranger there, she dismissed it as simply a bad asphalt job. That was closed due to uh, melting the heat. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. That was just a couple of days. It was the asphalt was soft. Mm -hmm. It was actually a, a bad asphalt job that they had done the summer previous to that. Okay. And that combined with the intensity of the sun in the middle of the summer, um, and that it was in a hydrothermal area, that it just got soft. Oh, okay. And they right. just had to replace it. So it had nothing to do with an increase in geothermal activity in that area, no. the ground being hotter, it was just no. the asphalt, was it? The, the the asphalt, yeah, it was the combination of those things in that particular spot. I hadn't visited Firehole Lake Drive when I spoke to her, or I would have challenged what she told me. Two months later, the road still doesn't look good. But more importantly, Yellowstone spokesman told the press at the time that people needed to stay away from the road because there was a high danger of stepping on seemingly solid soil into severely hot water. Contrary to what she said, Firehole Lake is an active geothermal area, and you can see that the road deteriorates as it comes into proximity to geothermal features. But it's what we've come to expect from government employees at every level, fear for their job if controversy erupts, and contempt for the public's right to know. If it was just a bad asphalt job, heated up by the sun, rather than increased ground temperature, then why are there other melted paved areas that they've just fenced off rather than try to fix? My suspicion is that the spots are so hot at the moment that they can't fix them. Ground temperature goes up and down with seismic activity in the park. We see between 1,000 and 3,000 earthquakes a year in Yellowstone. Most of them are so small, nobody ever feels them. Swarms of small earthquakes that you can't even feel can cause the ground to go through major changes. Look at this area that was once a forest. The ground was a hospitable environment for trees to grow for a long period of time. Then in 1978, swarms of small earthquakes caused the ground in this area to rise to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't the quakes, but the heat that killed the trees. 
So while we may be heading into another period of increased activity in Yellowstone, it's far from the largest activity we've seen since it became a park. Of course, everyone will tell you that it's not if, but when, the Super Caldera blows up. Yellowstone's supervolcano has been hit by a series of earthquakes, with more 30 recorded since June 12th. The latest was recorded on Monday, June 19th, with a magnitude 3 earthquake striking 8.6 miles north-northeast of West Yellowstone, Montana. The swarm began last week, and on June 15th saw a magnitude 4.5 earthquake take place in Yellowstone National Park. The epicenter of the shock was located in Yellowstone National Park, eight miles north-northeast of the town of West Yellowstone, Montana. Scientists from the University of Utah, which monitors Yellowstone Volcano, said in a statement. The earthquake was reportedly felt in the towns of West Yellowstone and Gardner, Montana, in Yellowstone National Park, and elsewhere in the surrounding region. This earthquake was the largest to have hit Yellowstone since March 30, 2014, when a magnitude 4.8 earthquake was recorded 18 miles to the east, near the Norris Geyser Basin. The 4.5 earthquake is part of an energetic sequence of earthquakes in the same area that began on June 12, the statement continued. This sequence has included approximately 30 earthquakes of magnitude 2 and larger and 4 earthquakes of magnitude 3 and larger, including today's magnitude 4.5 event. As of June 16, 235 events had been recorded. Most of these ranged in the magnitude of 0 to 1, with 5 less than 0. The University of Utah is part of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, YVO, which monitors volcanic and earthquake activity in Yellowstone National Park. Seismic activity at volcanoes can signal an eruption is due to take place, although predicting exactly when a volcano will erupt is.